So hi everyone. Uh, I'm my name is Abdul. Chen has already introduced me. I'm currently working at the University of Toronto and Toronto Rehab, and our my focus of research is uh, ballistocardiography and uh, smart textiles to do non-invasive and continuous health monitoring. Uh, at the same time, I have been collaborating with a lot of researchers. <laughs> So uh, I kind of have uh, some background in non-contact sensing as well. Uh, but I did my PhD from Georgia Institute of Technology, USA. Uh, and my focus of research was uh, ballistocardiography. So I, in this talk, I'm just going to give you all uh, a brief overview of what ballistocardiography is, because apparently what I have discovered moving to Canada and working with researchers here, that people have just started working in, in this field. And uh, I'm going to briefly summarize some of my work in BCG, what we are currently doing at Toronto Rehab using this methodology. and. Uh, where where do we intend to go with this, and what are the challenges that we think we are facing and we need to solve? So I'm just going to start uh, my talk, and before that, it's just a brief introduction slide uh, of, of the team we have at Toronto Rehab. Our director is Dr. Mihalides. Jen is very familiar with him, <laughs> and uh, this is our group here. Uh, and we are working on a lot of different projects. Some of us are working on radar, uh, physiological monitoring, fall detection. We are using computer vision technologies for, for monitoring elderly adults who have dementia. So people are working uh, on different projects in, in our team. So with this brief introduction, I'll basically start by explaining why I'm here or why I'm going to just talk for the next 40 minutes and bore you guys, is this is actually a brief summary of uh, the most recent report from American Heart Association. And according to this report, 25% uh, of the people have some sort of cardiovascular disorder. And uh, the costs associated with monitoring and diagnosing the any all these cardiovascular disorder is around $320 billion annually. That is one reason we are doing a lot of research to, to, to monitor it. But the bad news is that these numbers are kind of like projected to rise in the coming years. So in the next 10 years, one out of three person in this room is predicted to have some sort of cardiovascular problem. I hope not, but that's what the numbers say. And the costs are going to rise as well. At, at the same time, if that wasn't bad news enough, there is going to be a projected shortage of doctors across all specialities, according to the American Association of Medical Colleges, one of the reports. So you have increasing number of people who have cardiovascular disorders. At the same time, you have less number of doctors across all specialities, let alone cardiovascular uh, cardiology. So it's no surprise that uh, what we want to do to solve this problem is to shift uh, monitoring at least the monitoring technologies and from hospital to the homes, so be where people are more comfortable. And you can monitor them in when they're doing their everyday activities of everyday life. So the main aim is to take whatever we have here and shift it there. Because, I mean, this is very scary. Uh, there are a lot of machines there. My dad is a doctor, so I used to go to uh, like I've, I've been exposed to hospitals quite a lot. It's not a nice place to be there unless you're working there. So the main ideal is that whatever we have here, we want to transfer it to your rooms and you're in your houses. And we want to do it in a way that it is least obtrusive and non-invasive. And it does not disturb you when you are performing activities of your daily life. And that's one reason that for the last few years, we have seen an increase in the number of uh, medical devices being used at home. And this number is increasing, is going to increase in the coming years, as projected by one of the reports I saw online. So 
the problem we have so far, like this is a good trend, it's encouraging. More and more medical devices are being used at home for, for health monitoring. Uh, but there is a problem with, uh, with, there's a shortcoming with most of these devices. So we have all, I've listed a few names here on the left, uh, electrocardiogram, ECG devices, impedance cardiography, cardiography devices. There, is, there are two problems with all these devices that we have. Either they can't measure the mechanical parameters of physiological function, and I'll go into detail what, I, what do I mean by mechanical parameters. Uh, and the other is that they're obtrusive. Like, if you wanna wear an ECG device every day, uh, we, like I have worked with uh, patients who have heart failure, and if they're supposed to wear this device again and again, with the passage of time, their skin starts to come off because they have to stick the electrodes. So, all of these, in some way, are obtrusive. So in order to solve this problem, there are two ways to move forward. The first is basically you start moving towards sensors which are non-contact, like radar sensors. And then second is you start exploring new sensing modalities. And that's where ballistocardiography comes in. It's not, it's actually, actually it's a measure of your body vibrations when your heart ejects blood in in the vessels. And it's important to say here that it's not something new. It, so it was actually discovered in 1877 by Gordon and his friends. And later on in the mid 20th century, Starr and his colleagues showed that you can use these body vibrations and detect cardiovascular anomalies with those. But the problem at that time with the BCG was, uh, is you can see the equipment they had at that time to capture these small, these minute body vibrations. So there's no surprise that it didn't take off, the interest in BCG, because you had this cumbersome equipment which cannot be used at home, and at the same time, there were other technologies which basically were progressing like ECG and, and uh, imaging technology. So BCG kind of like, uh, people lost interest in it, and it kind of like vanished from the scene. But since the last 15, 20 years, with an increase in uh, uh, the biomems and the reduction in the size of the sensors we have today, we have seen uh, a surge in, in, in the, the devices and which use uh, ballistocardiography or BCG methodology for, for monitoring your health. And it ranges from, these devices range from the, the, the chair or the, the weighing scale or the air worn sensors that I have here. These are some of the, 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 the devices that I'm showing here, which are basically developed by different research groups like you, like here and in different universities. And also, we have started seeing some commercial products which use BCG as a sensing modality. For example, this sleep tracker called Bedded. It's actually lately acquired by Apple. It's a strip, you put it on your bed, uh, on your mattress, and then you sleep on it, and it uses your BCG signals to estimate your heart rate, and then does a sleep analysis. And at the same time, there's a commercial scale here which kind of monitors your blood pressure and, and, and heart rate when you stand on it. And other sensors include the AMFI films, which can be inserted under the bed. So there are a lot of applications in which uh, BCG is being employed these days. Now, I've been saying BCG, BCG for the last five minutes. And the question is, how does the BCG signal look like? And these are the few signals that I have plotted, like, I added on this slide just for reference, like the top signal, we are very familiar with that, it's an ECG signal. And the, the, the main feature of interest in an ECG signal is the R peak. So if you detect R peaks in the ECG signal, you estimate heart rate and a lot of different parameters from those. Now, just below it is ICG, which is impedance cardiogram, which is uh, used for estimation of your cardiac output and systolic time intervals. And this is how uh, an ICG signal looks like. Uh, then the two signals at the bottom, the one is, the blue one is the, the blistocardiogram signal, which is measured from a modified weighing scale that I showed on a previous picture. So if a person stands on the scale, this is what you get uh, as a BCG signal from him. And then the last one is, which we term as variable BCG, 
uh, is a, a, a signal of body vibrations that you measure from, from the chest. So if you have an accelerometer sensor and you place it on the chest, you can measure the, the, the body vibrations from the chest. You can refer to this as variable BCG, but if the vibrations are specifically measured from the chest, there is a specific name given to it called seismocardiogram, SCG. But you can get these vi body vibrations from any place, any location on your body. So the way the BCG signal processing is done is uh, you detect the R peaks in an ECG. So normally BCG is always coupled with ECG for some uh, extensive application. If you're if you if you're trying to measure heart rate, the signal the BCG signal is is alone is fine. You can take these the BCG signal. You can do some Fourier domain processing and estimate heart rate. If you want to get something more out of it, people combine it with ECG. And the way the processing works is that you detect two R peaks on an ECG signal. And whatever BCG signal is there in this portion between two R peaks, you take that. And then you keep on doing it. So you get frames of BCG signal. And once you have collected n number of frames, depending upon your application or whatever your objective is, you kind of like average them to reduce noise. And this term is called, uh, the term used for this is called ensemble averaging. So you have an ensemble of BCG frames, you average them to reduce noise. So this is how it works. I mean, this is actually the only maths equation in my whole slide, so <laughs> all the slides. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to appreciate it. <laughs> so, so once you have got this BCG frames, the parameter of interest so far is the position of this main peak, which is called the J peak. And if you take this J peak and estimate its time from the previous ECG R peak, you get an interval called RJ interval. So these kinds of interval based features and some other amplitude based features are used from BCG for monitoring a me mechanical function of your heart. Now, mechanical function of your heart, I need to explain it a little bit. So this is an ECG frame from the previous slide. This is again a BCG frame from the previous slide. What, what do we mean by mechanical health of the heart? We all know different phases of a cardiac cycle. So it basically is composed of two parts, diastole and systole. Systole is the portion where the blood is kind of ejected from the heart into the vessels. So before, so when the diastole phase is over and the ventricles of the heart are filled with blood, the systole phase kicks in, but in the initial portion of the systole phase, the heart begins to contract. But while it is contracting, no blood is ejected from it. And this is called pre-ejection period. So it kind of is a measure of the contractility of your heart. So the other phase of the systole is called the left ventricular ejection time, when the pulmonary and aortic valves open, the blood is ejected into the body, and this phase is called left ventricular ejection time. Now, research has shown that this RJ interval on the right is directly proportional to pre-ejection period. So you can use this measure to estimate cardiac contractility. At the same time, there are other features in the signal that you can use for estimation of left ventricular ejection time from, from the BCG or from variable accelerometer signals that you measure from the chest. So, these parameters, parameters, these systolic time intervals are, are basically related to the mechanical function of your cardiovascular system. So just quickly, the RJ interval, is that going to change depending on where you're taking your BCG from? It's going to change. The, it's, the value is going to change, but it's still going to be directly proportional to your uh, uh, pre-ejection period. So whatever location you decide, you need to collect some data, come up with a simple linear estimator, and then you're good to go. But if you change the location, it's going to change. So this figure here is from a BCG signal we acquired from a weighing scale, which was modified for this purpose. So this is basically the main use of the BCG signal to, to, to monitor mechanical health of the heart. Now, I'm just going to summarize a few of my works from my PhD. So in this work of mine, uh, we wanted to investigate the physiology behind the BCG signal. There were two reasons for it. We wanted to, to, to get into to, to depth of what BCG signal is most closely related to. E either it is related to the flow of the blood 
or is it related to the pressure of the blood? And at the same time, the second objective was that we wanted to use the BCG signal and see if we can estimate any of the parameters which are normally estimated from uh, an arterial blood pressure signal or an, or an ICG signal. And the reason is very straightforward. Doctors don't understand OJ interval, and they don't accept it. So it's important that you, you have to talk to them and you have to present it that it's related with the parameters which are already well known. So cardiac output and diastolic and systolic blood pressures are well known parameters. So rather than discussing RJ interval and how it can predict a lot of things, we wanted to see if we can map it to one of these parameters from these signals. So the, the idea was very simple. We collected some data. In the first phase of the work, we wanted to extract features from these different signals and see what kind of relationship exists between them. So what kind of relationship is there between the features that we have extracted from a BCG frame versus an ICG frame? And the second work was basically we would take this BCG signal and we would collect some data and then we'll train a linear system that would output an ICG. So if you basically train the system that maps BCG to ICG, so once the system is trained, whenever we have a BCG signal frame, we'll just feed it to the system, the output will be an ICG waveform. And once you get the waveform, you can get whatever you want from an ICG waveform that normally is there. And then we did the same thing with arterial blood pressure. So the results that we obtained, we and uh, for the relationship, we were able to show that the BCG is actually more closely related with an ICG signal. An ICG is related with the flow of the blood. It doesn't have to do anything with the pressure of the blood. So BCG, as far as physiology was concerned, the features that we would extract would be highly correlated with the similar features from impedance cardiogram. And in the second phase, we were able to show that if you have a BCG weighing scale and you train a system that takes an IC, uh, that that takes basically uh, an ECG waveform and maps it to an ICG. If you collect data from one person for the first day and you have trained the system, you can give the scale to the person for the next four days, and they, whenever they stand on the scale, the system will basically map it and estimate cardiac output. So we were able to show that BCG's a weighing scale can be used at home for for monitoring cardiovascular output or stroke volume. Stroke volume is used in cardiovascular. So this was one of the work that I did uh, during my PhD. Now, I have mentioned this before that BCG is a measure of body vibrations, and we are living in a world of variables today. So we have all these new variables appearing in market, or the same variable with different names. So you can use these variable devices to, to monitor BCG and then estimate mechanical parameters. And the, the simplest sensor that you can use to monitor body vibrations from any of these locations is a simple accelerometer. So if you have a tri accelerometer you, and you place it on the chest, you measure chest vibrations. The beauty, beauty of chest vibrations is they are composed of two parts. The low frequency part has to deal with the flow of the blood. So as the blood is ejected into your vessels, the low frequency portion of the, the vibrations you measure are related to that. And then the high frequency portion of the vibrations, because you're measuring it from the chest, is related with the opening and closing of heart valves. So if I know the points where the heart valves open and close, now I can estimate left ventricular ejection time, I can estimate pre-ejection period, I can use those values to estimate cardiac output. So the name given to these chest vibrations in literature is seismocardiogram. So there is a distinction, whole body vibrations are normally referred to as ballistocardiogram. But a special case of whole body vibrations when they're measured from the chest, they, these are called seismocardiogram. And since the accelerometer is used and it's a three axis accelerometer, you get data along more than one axis. So you can use all that data together, or you can combine it in some intelligent way to, for, for, for whatever objective or application you're working on. And this is what a simple uh, frame from an accelerometer placed at the chest looks like. So the, what I described earlier in the BCG was that you use ECG and you extract frames of BCG, and then you average them. 
If you do the same approach here, you'll see this kind of frame for the dorsoventral component, which is basically, if you place an accelerometer on the chest, the component which is just perpendicular to your chest is dorsoventral component, and this is how it looks like, and I have put some markers here indicating the AO is basically the opening of aortic valve, and then AC is the closing of the aortic valve, and the parameters that you can estimate from them. And then you can also look at the head to foot component, which is in downward direction, and this is how it looks like. Now this is actually double integrated, that's what I was talking to Ahmed in the afternoon. So this is not acceleration in head to foot direction. So we took the acceleration and we double integrated it to map it to displacement. So, but there isn't much work on how to combine these. I tried using a simple uh, fusion algorithm, uh, but this is one area that needs a little bit more research of how you can combine these or if you, you process them separately, the vibrations across multiple axes, how you can leverage that information to to the parameters you are estimating. So one of my works at PhD, in PhD at Georgia Tech was that we collaborated with University of California, San Francisco, and we designed this variable chest patch uh, that you can u wear with using gel electrodes. And this device would measure ECG and chest vibrations simultaneously. So the, the idea was that we'll get ECG and then we can use the ECG signal as reference to extract frames from this SCG accelerometer signal and do some processing. So one of my projects was to monitor patients who have heart failure using this variable patch. And the reason we focused on heart failure was that this is simply, uh, this is actually, I don't know if there's, this curve exists, because, but I think I drew it myself based on what I gathered during my PhD defense. So this is just a relationship between the filling volume of your heart and the cardiac output. In the normal heart, when you start doing some exercise, your cardiac output increases. But in the case of people who have heart failure, this relationship is not there. So you would expect that if they're walking or they're running, their cardiac output would increase, but that doesn't happen. So if you go from, if you go in this direction, there is an increase in contractility of your heart. So the, if you're doing some exercise, your heart rate increases. And so your pre-ejection period will decrease as well. So the contractility, which is the inverse of pre-ejection period is gonna increase in case of people who have normal heart. So we thought that since we can get this contractility information from the variable vibrations, let's use this measure and see if we can monitor people who have heart failure. And the other reason was because heart failure is a, a disorder which can, like it can be cured. It, if people who have heart failure have to live with it for the rest of their lives, they can manage it, but it's not like they'll just get rid of it. And 25% of the people who are, have heart failure, whenever they are discharged from hospitals and they go home, they are readmitted because the condition aggravates with passage of time. So if you can use some kind of a variable device that I showed you on the previous slide and predict when the condition is getting bad, maybe you can avoid a lot of costs and a lot of like a catastrophic event that could happen uh, by telling them that they should go to the doctor first. So for, for this project, we did the simple six minute walk test, which people who have heart failure do. So they, they're asked to walk for six minutes, and then we measure the distance that they have walked, and also other parameters related to it. So six minute walk test is very famous, it's kind of like considered as a gold standard for analyzing the status of heart pa patients who have heart failure. The protocol was basically one minute standing, then we asked them to walk for six minutes, and then we asked them to stand for five minutes in, in recovery. And what we were able to sh show that uh, if you take this pre-ejection period, so this is the top one is an ECG wave, and then the below is the, the chest vibrations. If you take this pre-ejection period, for each person, if you estimate the change in pre-ejection period before they started walking to after they have walked, 
we saw that there is a statistical significant difference for patients who have who are belonging to New York Heart uh, Association class one and two. So class one and two, New York Heart Association, I guess is kind of like uh, some guidebook to put people who have heart failure, grading yeah, grading system. So we were able to show that the people who are doing well and who have heart failure, they, the pre-ejection, the change in pre-ejection is statistically significantly different from who are belonging to class four. In class four, patients of heart failure are doing unfortunately really bad. Like some of them wouldn't be able to complete the six minute walk test without stopping. So that was just a preliminary work, but we wanted to, to take it further and see that if we just remove the ECG and we just take the chest vibration signals, is there some way we can just look at the vibration signal and use some modern graph theory or machine learning method to differentiate between people who are doing good and doing bad? Now, I should have said this earlier, heart failure patients are graded in classes, class one and class two that you guys have seen. They're also divided in two categories by the physician, which is called compensated and decompensated. So compensated patients are the ones who are doing well, and decompensated patients are the ones whose symptoms are actually getting worse. So this work of mine, and I was a part of the group that did this, this work, uh, and it just got accepted last month after one and a half year interview. Mm -hmm. So I was very pleased. <laughs> but the whole idea was that you take the, the chest vibrations along three axes and you combine them, you average them after you have done filtering and everything. So now you get an average chest vibration signal from the three axes. And then you divide these, this average chest vibration signal into windows of a time duration. And then for each window, you would do a Fourier transform. And then in the spectrum that you obtain, you would estimate power in different frequency bins. So if you see this uh, image here, you'll have, these are the frequency bins. So let's say there are L frequency bins. So you estimate the power in, uh, in, for each uh, uh, frame of SCG signal that you've done Fourier transform on. And you do the same process for the recovery phase and for the rest. So you'll get a matrix where the columns are basically representing frequency bins and the rows are representing observations. So we would just take these features from the frequency domain, take the median from both the matrices and plot them using K nearest neighbor technique in the form of a graph. So I'm, I'll, I'll avoid going into these complicated details, but what the KNNN based graph does is that you put, you do KNNN cl clustering, and then you join uh, the, the nodes which satisfy a certain uh, requirement. So if the, the Euclidean distance between two nodes is less than some threshold, you kind of like join them. So in the right top corner of the figure you're seeing, the nodes are basically the vertices are these x1 and x2 values, which are the median of the matrix that we have obtained. So these are basically the power in frequency bands. So we would join them in, in the form of a graph, and then we'll calculate a graph similarity score for the same person in the, uh, for the resting phase versus the recovery phase. So the way graph similarity score is calculated is that once you have this graph, you see, you name these vertices, you name these vertices, you give them labels, and you see if V6 is in this graph, it is connected to V1, and then in this graph, V6 is connected to V1, so there is one similar edge in both, so your similarity score is one. Now if V6 is connected to V3 here, and here it is also connected to V3, so now you're graph similarity score is two. So this is how you calculate the graph similarity score. And what we were able to see that people who are compensated, their graph similarity score was low. And the reason is that for any of you, for normal people, if you are at rest, like I'm right now, if I start walking, my physiology is gonna change. So when I'm gonna stop, my heart rate and all those parameters which have been elevated, they're gonna take some time 
to come back to the normal value. So there is going to be less similarity in the resting and the recovery phase. But the patients who were decompensated, there was very high similarity, as if there wasn't any change in their physiology when they did the six-minute walk test. So we were able to show that the graph similarity score for compensated and decompensated patients, there is a statistically significant difference. And you can just use the standalone chest vibrations with some graph theory uh, methods to, to, to monitor the state of the patients. So this is actually the whole recovery data and the whole resting data. We were also able to show, we actually we observed that for all patients, the first minute of recovery is important. Afterwards, they're kind of like all similar because that's the amount of time your, 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 your cardiovascular system will take to return back to normal. So this was what I have done uh, in my PhD research and what I was a part of. The last work is actually still going on in my previous lab at Georgia Tech. That was the, the, the project that I was part of, but no, I'm not. Uh, but they are still taking it further and using some more data and more machine learning methodologies to see what they can extract. The question is, what is next? We have seen wing scale sensor data. We have seen variable census data. Where, where are we going with health monitoring at home? And how will BCG monitoring fit there? And the answer is, and you guys have heard this a long time, like IoT, Internet of Things. It's everywhere. You put it on a paper, it gets accepted. Mm -hmm. So IoT, and what we are envisioning at Toronto Rehab is that these sensors, different sensors, not only BCG sensors, different sensors are embedded in the objects of your house. So you don't have to do anything special. You go to the bed, you sleep, when you wake up, the sensors in your bed have all the information about your sleep and you get it. Then you walk on this carpet and it monitors your gait and balance. You go to the restroom, you have a smart bathroom mat or something that monitors your weight, monitors your heart rate, everything. You sit on a sofa, there are ECG and BCG sensors. So this is where we are going forward to, and, and you can see many of these, sense, these, these, these things in the house, there is a potential that BCG sensors can be used here. So as a first step at Toronto Rehab, uh, one of the uh, graduate students in our lab with whom I'm working now, his name is Isaac, he worked on this tile, floor tile, that simultaneously measures ECG and BCG. So you see these metallic electrodes on the top. So if you stand on the tile like he's standing here, it will measure your ECG and BCG signal. And then you can also put the tile in front of the toilet seat. Uh, so the re we are doing research on this, but it, it works. And the whole idea is zero effort monitoring. So you go to the kitchen in the morning when you're taking cereal out of your cupboard or anything, and you stand on the tile, and it measures the data from you and gives you uh, information about your health. So this is what we are doing at Toronto Rehab along with a lot of other things. The question is, what are the challenges we have right now with BCG? I have talked at length on how BCG can be used for monitoring mechanical function of your cardiovascular system. You can use it for monitoring heart rate, but it, then the question is like, what's next? What's left there that we can estimate? And the first thing is hypertension. So you, we need these body vibrations to we, we need to use them to estimate uh, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure because a lot of people around the world have hypertension. And if they can monitor it continuously in a zero effort technology format without putting the blood pressure cuff on or without wearing anything, that's going to be a huge plus point. So the way different groups are working, my previous group at Georgia Tech is combining BCG with other sensors. So their idea is to use which we call as pulse transit time. So you get a signal from BCG and you, you measure a signal from a photoplethysmography sensor, a PPG signal, and then you combine them to estimate pulse transit time. Now it's important here to distinguish what is pulse arrival time 
and what is pulse transit time. Now, pulse arrival time is, as the name suggests, is the time when the, when the PPG pulse arrives at the location where you're measuring it. But pulse arrival time has a component of pre-ejection period. And it's not always the case that if your, heart, if your blood pressure increases, most of the time your pre-ejection period decreases. But that's not always true. For some cases, pre-ejection period is not affected by blood pressure. And that's the, that's the reason that you need to remove this pre-ejection period from pulse arrival time and get an estimate which is called pulse transit time. So in my PhD work, we did some preliminary work on using the weighing scale, and we put a PPG sensor on the toe to get a PPG waveform. And then the BCG waveform would give us the RJ interval, which we have already calibrated against pre-ejection. And then we'll estimate pulse transit time by taking a difference of those. So that's one way to go forward. The other way is this group in, I think Simon Fraser University, I'm not entirely sure, it's Dr. Tavakolian's group. He's very famous in SCG from Canada. They are using multiple accelerometers. So if you put more than one accelerometer at different locations, one of them is gonna pick a wave before the other one. So that minute time interval, if you can estimate, you can get pulse transit time. So these are the two ways people are moving forward with, with using BCG for hypertension. But it's still an open question. Like, if you guys can come up with another alternative, it's awesome. Because still, PPG, you have to wear something. And the whole point is you don't want to wear something. The second is you want to do, uh, you want to have these devices in which BCG sensors are embedded, and you want to use them to monitor people who have cardiovascular disorders. Now, it sounds very simple, but it's not. Getting data is the toughest part. Once you get it, everything is easy afterwards. It's to that point, like writing the protocol, getting it accepted, finding patients. So that's one thing we have to do is to, to see what other cardiovascular disorders, other than heart failure, that we can use. And there are many people who have ischemia, you, you see PhysioNet, the online data resource, there's a lot of data on it, but all of them, they, they lack BCG. The third is you want to do a standalone processing of BCG. So you want to remove ECG from the equation. And the reason is very simple. You have to put electrodes on the chest. You don't want to do that because after some time, people lose interest or if they're patients, their skin starts to come off mm -hmm. because they're wearing it so much. Mm -hmm. So you want to process the BCG signal without the help of ECG signal. One way we are dealing is, like I showed you before, Isaac, who designed this tile at Toronto Rehab, is you just stand on the tile and it measures your ECG from your feet. The challenges you're facing there is that if you move a little bit, the whole signal is gone. So that's, that's the, another one. Now, and then the, the last one, which is the most important one, is because these are vibrations, they're all affected by motion. The moment you start moving, they're gone. There's like, Mo and what researchers do, and in a few of my first papers as well, the solution is you ignore the data. But that's not a solution, because if you want to monitor people, you want to capture their physiological information where doing some exercise, because exercise changes human physiology. And that's, the, like, when somebody is doing exercise, you really know whether they're healthy or not. So you want to, clean this signal. This is an example chest vibration signal uh, when the person is at rest. As soon as the person starts to walk, this information is gone. So we need to come up with some signal processing algorithms to either denoise this information or use this with some other processing way to get what we want from it. Now in my PhD work, and I didn't mention it in detail, we used empirical mode decomposition. So if you have a signal, you can decompose it into different components. And Fourier transform is doing the, Fourier series is doing the same thing, discrete cosine transform, wavelet, they're all doing the same thing. We used empirical mode decomposition and we decomposed the signal into its parts and we saw that the one of the component from empirical mode is exactly the same as this signal. But it's not a complete solution. There should be more work that has to be done on this for, for monitoring BCG during motion. So I'll just conclude 
uh, my talk with this image here, and the left one is actually reactive care, what we have had for a long time. And that is that if a person who has some so sort of cardiovascular problem, uh, he's at home, his condition is getting bad, symptoms are appearing, and then suddenly a catastrophic event happens, and then he's rushed to the hospital, and you diagnose and you, you, you treat him. Uh, for like my, my own mom, uh, she had a heart attack, uh, I think in 2000, I don't remember exactly, and we only took her to hospital when she was feeling a great deal of pain. But her symptoms, as I recall, started to appear two days before. And we didn't figure out because we weren't expecting. So the problem is that if such an event happened, like in my mother's case, she's doing fine now, but a heart attack damages your cardiac muscles. So it's still a catastrophic event. So what we want to do is move this, this, thing, this scheme <coughs> to a proactive care system where people who are at home are constantly monitored. And when there is a certain change in their condition or you start to see initial symptoms, you wanna alert them to go to the doctor or do you just want, you inform the doctor or the hospital, the device does it itself. And this way you can prevent them from having such a massive event happen. And for, to do that, we need to combine sensors to increase the robustness one sensor is not like always sufficient in many cases. We need to have come up with intelligent algorithms which can provide some context on, like, so if I'm, I'm standing here, we need to come up with an intelligent algorithms that kind of gives me, give us some perspective if that if an event <coughs> happened, how it happened, and what was the person doing before that. So, and at the same time, we, you wanna come up with the algorithms that can be changed from person to person. So if I'm using a device, it works on me. If Jen starts using it, it works on her. We don't need to modify anything because the moment you start, you need to modify parameters, it's a hassle, it's not zero effort anymore. And after some time, people stop doing it. So these are the, 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 uh, the directions that we have to uh, to follow for, for BCG or any other or sensing modality. So thank you so much. And if you guys have any question, I'll be happy to answer. So, so there's one of the graphs where you said that you, for your accelerometer on the chest, um, you had double integrated it to get position. Yeah. So I was wondering how you did that without your signal drifting away. You, so the way you do it is uh, whenever you integrate, there is a low pass, uh, there is a low frequency component in the signal. So if you keep on integrating it, it starts to drift. Mm -hmm. So the way we did was that we would integrate it, high pass filter it. Integrate it, high pass filter it. So that we, after every integration step, we were able to get rid of the, the, the low frequency component. Um, does the magnitude of your signal matter at all? Or For the studies that I did and which are we, we are currently doing, uh, no, because we're focusing on timing intervals, but the, it should matter and m maybe some of the parameters for cardiovascular function are related to it. But people haven't investigated it in much detail. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's hard. I guess if you you can expect the frequencies that you're going to be seeing from your body, right? So you can tune your filters based on that. Yeah, but then you have to tune it for each person separately because each person is different, right. and then then it becomes like it becomes subject specific, and it's good, but it's not generalizable. Yeah, another thing with the accelerometers, as I understand, MEM sensors are very sensitive to environmental things like temperature changes and stuff too, right? So if you're on a body, that's uh, possibly problematic. That's actually a good point, but so far, whatever work I have done with accelerometers or MEM sensors, we didn't see that much change. So all these sensors come up with some kind of like, um, like a range in which they are working. So we never expose them to extreme conditions. So I, I, I suspect if you 
take one of these sensors and go to a very hot place, it might start behaving a little bit weird. Am I bad at something here? So a lot of, a lot of MEMS accelerometers now will include a temperature sensor so that they will compensate for the stiffness of the springs because they're tiny springs, right? So they'll have a temperature other mister in there to, to tune it for whatever the, the local temperature is because it does matter, yeah. They're such little tiny things, so. So that's interesting, actually. I didn't know that they have integrated temperature sensors. Yeah, most of them will now okay. because of that particular yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned it's patient-specific, essentially. Is it also session-specific? So if you, you, know, you move it a bit and rotate it a bit? It's the vibrations are going to change. I didn't do much work on that, but one of my colleagues in my previous lab, she came up with an algorithm so that if you change the position, the, it can detect that the algorithm can detect that it's not at the right position. Ideally, it should be placed on the sternum. If you move it left or right, you're still gonna get timing intervals. If you're getting some information related to amplitude, that's gonna change. But as far as timing intervals are concerned, you're always gonna get them. But still, uh, she worked on this and she came up with an algorithm. So this is the ideal location, but if you move it, it can detect. Or if you move it, it can map it back to, to this. So sort of you are expecting the, like a patient to be able to put this on him or herself at home themselves. Yes, it like, that, it's wearable so they have to put it on. And that's one reason the next thing we're doing is coming up with these technologies in which they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. But the point here is that even the wearable technologies have not been explored to the max. Like we haven't exhausted all the approaches for the variables. So there is still room for estimation, a lot of these things from the variables. So that's one reason to keep focusing on the variables. But at the same time, you gotta look at the new technologies as well. I think it was your 10th slide where you showed the waveforms of ECG and BCG and all of those waveforms. And I was just wondering, like ECG waveform was very nice and periodic, but as compared, like compared to that, BCG waveform is like as it goes further, uh, you lose that shape. Yeah, it's actually, it's a, it, it, the, the reason you do, so the BCG waveform is very sensitive to motion. So if a person moves a little bit, you're gonna see change in the BCG waveform. That is why it's not always nice as the ECG. And that is one reason that people do ensemble averaging. So you kind of like average out the noise. So the resultant signal just looks like this. That's, that's like, like nice clean. Um, so with the ensemble average though, if you're looking for acute events and you're monitoring Time, is that then going to be problematic? It could be, but then it again depends how you're ensemble averaging. So in my work, we would ensemble average using, so there are two ways to ensemble average. You can either ensemble average based on duration. So the number of frames you have in 30 seconds, you average them. Now you lose all the information related to the acute event. The other way is you take frames. You ensemble average based on frames. So you, you can assemble average using three frames or four frames or, or five frames. In fact, I think I might have an additional slide here somewhere if I remember. Oh, no, I don't. So what we're able to show is that for even with the algorithm that we used for removing noise from walking, you can go as low as to seven beeps and capture a clean signal. Mm -hmm. But as the speed of walking increases, this number increases. So if you're in a resting state, now you have the ability to even go further down. So you are fine by averaging two, three, or four beats, depending upon your condition. Mm -hmm. And that acute information is now not lost mm -hmm. in four beats. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Um, you did mention about the k nearest uh, neighbor clustering technique. I was just curious, um, did you uh, adopt it from uh, somewhere or uh, did you guys? Um... 
No, we didn't come up with the K nearest neighbor. No, 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 no. You didn't come up with, but coupling that with graph theory and uh, 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 kind of using it as as um, in the application area, do you see its utility elsewhere as well for um, for similar applications? Yeah, and um, so if you go to that paper, and it's actually open access, you can find the references uh, which are there, and some of them are based on applications, but. Specifically answer your question, yes, graph theory is, the graph similarity score can be used in a lot of different applications. So it depends what you want to do with it. So the guy who worked on it, he's a postdoc at my professor's lab at Georgia Tech. His background is all graph theory. Mm -hmm. So once you have, it's just like this, like if I have worked on something a, a, a methodology, if I see data, I'm like, oh, maybe I can apply that and see how it works. And if it works, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. If it works. Yeah. If, if it's good. <laughs> um, I, I, like, I really like this because it, it, the ECG gives you the electrical activity, so you're getting the like EMG almost, and then, um, you're getting the timing of the burst, but then I like that you're getting the mechanical output. I, I think that's really a, a, a nice piece there. Um, and we, we see that a lot in, I do a lot of work in motor control, and a lot of the work around reflexes is a similar thing where there are a lot of people studying, you know, reflexes, yeah, they're there, they're there, we're seeing it in the EMG, but the actual mechanical effect of reflexes is very interesting because it doesn't always actually produce a torque, for example, right? There's all these, there's all these, these other effects associated with reflexes. Um, and I'm, it made me think a little bit too because I know you're going towards this whole monitoring piece here, but uh, we don't do a lot of the mechanical output monitoring, even in like an intensive care unit, for example. Do we do much of that in, 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 the, in the clinic or in intensive care, for example? Do we do much of the mechanical monitoring of, of uh, I mean, do, I guess you do pressure. Um, you do blood pressure, you also do cardiac output. You do? Yeah, if you see, if you see the monitor, uh, you'll see uh, cardiac output this liters per minute. So that is a parameter related to. Okay, so that, that's what you're trying to get at as a surrogate in for ICD, okay. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, it's thank interesting. you. Interesting, like, so we, sorry. We're talking about this a bit today at lunch and just, cause I've done some work on the floor tile and other stuff as well. And it's very interesting that there's so much information in BCG, but it's not used because the medical model wasn't developed around it. So, you know, like Abdul said, the actual technology to capture it just wasn't there back when they were starting to be able to capture all these other parameters for acute clinical medicine. And so now that we can capture BCG a lot more effectively, um, it's not accepted in a clinical setting because they haven't trained on it, so they don't know what to do with it. So, you know, it's a really interesting, and for me and for Abdul and others, exciting opportunity and a great example, again, of cross-collaboration, transdisciplinary collaboration, working with clinicians to figure out, okay, how do we then map this into something that you can use? And then thinking ahead, you know, how do we start incorporating this into the medical model so that then it is another parameter at their disposal to be able to make more informed choices and more a deeper analysis of someone's health by helping figure out how do we make this new metric accessible. And, and contrary, like, you know, we can combine a lot of this stuff now. Are there new metrics that are a combination of, say, you know, EMG and BCG and stuff like that that can tell us even more that we just haven't figured out how to do yet, right? Now that we can capture the data, what kind of metrics um, are actually predictive and healthy. So it's a really cool problem, but it also requires working very closely with clinicians. Cause like, yeah, we can give you a BCG signal, but if you hand that to a cardiologist, they will have no idea what to do with that, right? They're, they're like, that's interesting. They're like, that's novel, that's great. This tells me, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to interpret this data in terms of like clinical outcomes and actionable items and is this person healthy and et cetera. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just gonna add, I, was, I told Jen, my dad is a doctor, so he never understands what I'm doing. He's like, body vibrations? What are you gonna do with that? <laughs> like, is this ECG? I was like, no, it's not. It's an RG tool, and he's like, I don't know. 
so yeah, it's it's actually it's very important for people in our field. And one of my close friends, who was uh, he's, he's now a close friend, and he was on my defense committee, not that much, but <laughs> so so he told me that there are few things that you can get out of the signal that you like and understand, but the doctors don't want it. But there are a few things that the doctors want and you can't get out of the signal. But then you, going, you need to find a middle ground. You need to find the things which you want and the doctors want, but you have to convince them mm -hmm. that they can use it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably gonna take some time. Right. Training gentle persuasion. And just showing efficacy, right? So, the, and that's, that's a real key because it's kind of chicken and egg, you know, until someone with clinical background starts buying in and using different types of signals in their diagnostics. You can't really tell how that maps onto actual health in a way where clinicians are going to buy into, okay, this is actually telling me something new and valuable about this person's health. It's a really cool, very difficult, but very cool challenge, right? And soon medical models will make all our decisions for us, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Deep learning, what? <laughs> anyway, uh, any more questions? So thank you very much for taking the time to come to speak to us today. Thanks, everyone.